It is almost a given these days that to be a good person, one needs empathy, the ability to understand and even share the feelings of others. But our next guest argues, putting that kind of emotional appeal at the core of our decision-making is a mistake. Paul Bloom makes that case in his new book, Against Empathy, The Case for Rational Compassion. He is the Brooks and Suzanne Reagan Professor of Psychology at Yale University, and he joins us now on the line from New Haven, Connecticut. Paul, it's good to have you on the program. You're a Montrealer originally, of course, so uh, welcome to one of your home country stations. Can we put it like that? You could definitely put it like that. I'm glad to be here, and I'm kind of glad to be back. Amen to that. Let's start with an excerpt from your book. Here we go. Sheldon, if you would, bring this excerpt up. Empathy has its merits. It can be a great source of pleasure, involved in art and fiction and sports, and it can be a valuable aspect of intimate relationships. And it can sometimes spark us to do good. But on the whole, you write, it's a poor moral guide. It grounds foolish judgments and often motivates indifference and cruelty. It can lead to irrational and unfair political decisions. It can corrode certain important relationships, such as between a doctor and a patient, and make us worse at being friends, parents, husbands, and wives. I am against empathy, and one of the goals of this book is to persuade you to be against empathy too. Well, that is obviously, Paul, I don't have to tell you, a counter to everything that we hear everywhere these days. So let's start from the beginning. How are you defining empathy? It's a good place to start because people use the word in different ways. Some people think of empathy in terms of everything good, everything kind, compassionate, moral, being a good neighbor. I'm not against that. In fact, I'm for that. Other people use empathy in terms of understanding others, getting yourself in, in other people's heads. And I'm not against that, too. That could be a force for good and a force for evil, depending on, depending on who's using it. The sense of empathy I'm against is feeling what other people feel, feeling their happiness, feeling their pain, feeling their experiences. Many people think that this is a force for good, but I think if you look at it closely, you'll see it makes us worse people. Why is it a poor moral guide in your view? Well, it has several problems. I'll just quickly say three of them. It's biased. We naturally feel empathy for people who look like us, people who are from our group, from our country, people who are attractive, people who are young. It's hard to feel empathy for strangers, for those who frighten us, for those who disgust us. And so empathy feeds into all sorts of bias, including racist bias. It's a numerate. We feel empathy for the one more than 100. And so it grounds foolish decisions where we end up focusing our energies for a single person, often at the cost of many, many more. And finally, it could be weaponized. And I, we see this now in American politics, actually. But uh, unscrupulous politicians and demagogues can use our empathy for suffering people as a way to motivate aggression and cruelty towards the groups that are said to make them suffer. A lot of the most violent rhetoric you get is actually driven by empathy. Well, since you've used that word weaponized, let me pull an example out of the book that, uh, that we can embellish on here. You wrote about how the public's reaction to the Newtown shooting demonstrates your anti-empathy argument. Why don't you make that case for us now? So that was a case where people were very well-intentioned. And this wasn't so much a case of weaponization, but it was a case where you see empathy has gone wrong. So after the, the shootings in Newtown, not far from where I live, this horrible mass murder, people started sending uh, gifts to the town teddy bears and money and presents. Now, it was a rich town, and they actually got more teddy bears than they knew what to do with. They started asking people, stop, stop sending us this stuff. Send it to poor people. Um, but people wouldn't stop. Even though they were asked to, they had this empathic itch they had to scratch, this feeling they had to, they, they, they had to deal with. And this led them to behave in a way that actually made the world a bit worse. Now that's a kind of a mild case. A more extreme case is when empathy for people who are suffering doesn't just lead to misguided giving, but actually leads to support for violence and for war. And uh, we see that in, in the current political scene, both in North America and in Europe. Well, let's take the Sandy Hook example then. If not sending in teddy bears to an extreme uh, as, a, as a response to what people, you know, as you would acknowledge, deeply felt about that massacre, what would have yep. been a preferable response in your view? Well, in that case, seeing what the people needed, giving what they needed and trying to help, and being responsive to what could actually make the world a better place. So in my book, I make the case for what I call, what's called effective altruism, which is giving, helping, but always helping with an eye towards what could make the most difference. And that'll push you in a different direction 
than if you're motivated by what makes you feel good or what kind of sparks your, your, your empathic feelings. I have heard people say things, however, like, it just hits me more deeply to help one person who may be begging outside a subway station or at a bus stop than getting my head around the notion of a thousand people being killed by a typhoon halfway around the world. That's understandable at some level, isn't it? It's human nature. It's very understandable. But all sorts of things are understandable. It's understandable that people who look like me instinctively, automatically care more for white people than dark-skinned people. It's understandable that we're more drawn to help an attractive child than an ugly child. Those are, that's human nature is how our psychology works. But we're not limited to that. We're also smart enough to recognize that even though it doesn't feel the same, maybe it doesn't feel as good, helping a thousand people is better than helping one. And a life in Africa is worth just as much as a life in Canada. Uh, okay, but let me challenge that a bit. You say, obviously, in, in a strict numbers-to-numbers -numbers comparison, helping a thousand people halfway around the world is better than helping one person here. But if you're the person who's going to see that one person every day, and you never see that thousand people halfway around the world, uh, what lifts your metaphorical boat better? Um, if you want to be happy, if you want to get a rush, you should help people close to you. You should donate to causes, multiple causes, that give you kind of a satisfactory buzz when you give to each one of them. You should deal with people who will be able to thank you and feel grateful for you. That's not bad. If you want to make the world a better place, you want to help as many people as possible, you really honestly care for people, you got to do something different. So I don't doubt for a second that this sort of immediate short-term giving makes people happy. Um, I would just think that there's more to life than, than trying to make yourself satisfied. And one reason why many of us give is because we honestly want to help people, and that'll push us in a different direction. Understood. Let's look at the neuroscience of this, because you go into that in your book as well. And you have sort of three major findings on empathy that I'd like to go into in some detail right now. First, uh, the so-called Bill, uh, Bill Clinton question, which is, can I actually feel your pain? So, in some way, you might think that's just kind of a weird metaphor. But it's more than a metaphor. There's various neuroscience studies where you get somebody and they, get, and they watch somebody in pain. Maybe the person is mildly shocked or puts their hand in freezing water or gets poked. And it turns out if the conditions are right, um, you, that subject then responds in their brain. They give a neural response that's kind of the same as if they themselves were getting shocked or poked or, 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 or put their hand in cold water. So there's a sense in which it's literal. You literally feel what another person is feeling. Notice, though, the same studies find that empathy is picky. One of my favorite studies involves sports fans in Europe where they did this experiment and they told people, the person you're looking at is a fan of your same soccer team. Then you get empathy. You feel a person's pain. But if they're told the person you're looking at is a fan of the opposing soccer team, um, empathy shuts down. And instead, when they watch the person in pain, they get a shiver of pleasure run through their <laughs> brain. So, so you know, em empathy plays favorites. And, and remind me, I think I read this in your book, but uh, in case I have uh, misremembered it, you let me know. That depth of the shared experience over the love of a football team or a hockey team or whatever can be deeper, actually, than DNA. It can be deeper than if you're from the same country as uh, somebody else or, uh, or, you know, that kind of thing. Have I got that right? We are very in-groupy creatures. And if there's a group you affiliate with, uh, uh, your, your, your military, your country, your family, that will win out. And sometimes country wins out for people, but not always. For some people, sports team wins out. Hmm. For some people, ethnicity wins out. Some people might say, oh, I don't care whether or not I'm a Canadian or American. It just matters that the other person is white or, or Asian or whatever. And, um, and, and I think when we look at this, often we, we say to ourselves, well, that's how our sentiments work, but we're also smart enough to say that maybe isn't how we should live as people, particularly when it comes to important moral choices. But the neuroscience here suggests that my brain will actually respond differently to you and to your feelings if I actually like you. Is that right? Yep. If you like me, uh, if I was nice to you in the past, you'll respond differently. You'll respond differently if I have the same skin color as you. 
You'll respond differently if you think I'm to blame for my fate. There was a study involving empathy for people who were described as having AIDS. When they were described as having AIDS through a blood transfusion, um, it had a lot of empathy, neural empathy, very powerful. But if they were described as getting AIDS through irresponsible behavior like unsafe sex, the empathy shut down. So empathy is not some sort of wise, powerful, glowing force that makes us good people. It rather reflects certain judgmental, often unfair and irrational processes that guide us to favor empathy for some and not for others. Okay, let's do a second excerpt from your book, Sheldon. I'm on page three now at the top. Let's bring this up. It turns out that there is some association between empathy and politics along the directions that you'd expect. But this association is not as strong as people believe it is. There are conservative positions that are deeply grounded in empathy and liberal positions that are not. Being against empathy won't tell you what to think about gun control, taxation, health care, and the like. It won't tell you who to vote for or what your general political philosophy should be. Again, uh, Paul, you're sort of spitting in the, in the wind of conventional wisdom on some of that, so uh, amplify on that if you would. Yeah, it's, it's, it, I, I like that quote because people often say, well, you're against empathy, you must be against progressive or liberal causes. Um, but actually, empathy is an irrational way of, of guiding your morality, and it's used on, by both the left and the right. So arguments in favor of uh, diversity and affirmative action often try to get you to feel empathic towards a minority, while arguments against it try to make you feel empathic for some, uh, say, some white kid who doesn't get into school. Arguments about gun control focus on the suffering of an innocent victim of gun crime. Arguments in favor of gun rights focus you on um, the, the experience of someone who was assaulted and unable to defend herself because she wasn't allowed to have a weapon. For each political argument of any substance, people use empathy on both sides. It's not a matter of do you empathize or not, but rather who you empathize with. And, um, and so I think both sides use it, and I think to the extent both sides use it, they're both making a moral mistake. Any large-scale policy, like health care or going to war, it's going to have winners and losers. There's going to be people who suffer, there's going to be people who benefit. So you can always find somebody, pluck them out and tell a story about them, and try to persuade people that way. But that's a horrible way to do policy. And one way to think about it is, some really important issues like climate change, actually empathy is kind of quiet about. One reason why it's very hard to get people uh, 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 motivated by climate change and similar concerns is that there's no identifiable victims. There's nobody to put yourself in the shoes of. And yet, we're also smart enough to acknowledge that these are important issues. Well, let me do an example from uh, just over a year and a half ago from uh, north of the border here. Uh, the Conservatives had been in power for uh, almost a decade here in Canada. The leader of the third place party in the parliament, Justin Trudeau, whose father, you will remember, was prime minister as well, uh, had, I think it's, I don't mean to be ungenerous in saying this, but had one of the thinnest political resumes of anybody standing for prime minister in Canadian history. And yet people saw him as being kind of the empathetic antidote to the previous decade, and he did something unprecedented. He went from third to first in one election and won a majority government. Clearly, people in Canada, or a good chunk of them, four out of 10 anyway, prized empathy above a lot of other qualities and made their votes based on that. Are you telling them they were all wrong to do so? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's um, you could, you could, rule, you could uh, choose to vote for somebody because they're, they make good decisions, because they care about you. But the idea that they put yourself in their shoes and feel what you feel is actually, I think, a poor guide to making such an important political decision. And in fact, um, you're talking about north of the border, what about south of the border? Um, Donald Trump had a thinner political resume than Justin Trudeau by a long shot. Um, and he's now our president, not because he was a very empathic character, I think even his, his supporters don't see him as particularly empathic, but because he was able to exploit empathy through the political season. In particular, he's able to exploit empathy for those who have been left out of the growing economy, those who he said were the victims of uh, lost their jobs to immigrants, the victims of immigrant crime, the victims of Muslim crime. And he used the empathy for these people to catalyze his political movement. Um, and whatever you think of Donald Trump, whatever you think of Justin Trudeau, uh, you've got to acknowledge a better way to do it would be to ask, 
can these people actually improve the lives of people in the country? Forget about the depth of their feeling. Forget about the stories that they tell. Um, are they rational? I, the, the subtitle of my book is A Case for Rational Compassion. Are they rational individuals? Do they care about others? Well, Donald Trump, I think the uh, perhaps the most unforgettable line of his uh, convention speech was, let me be your voice. He was making that, yes. that call to empathy to the people uh, who ultimately ended up voting for him. Are you arguing that there was ultimately great harm in responding to that call? Yeah, I think that, I, I think it is entirely legitimate for somebody to say, I want to elect somebody who will take my side on issues, who will care about me, who will, who will watch for my interests. But those are the sorts of things you should focus on. A simple appeal to empathy promises that I, sh I, I know what, what it feels like, I know where you stand. I think are easy to produce and I think are, are, they're the wrong direction. I think in general we do much better as individuals, as policymakers, and as political deliberators if we use our heads rather than our hearts. You don't want to get, you don't want to elect a leader who's a psychopath. You don't want to get a leader who has no compassion. But it's not depth of feeling that distinguishes good leaders from bad leaders. It's rather intelligence and planning and honesty and discipline. We'll do one more excerpt from your book in our last uh, remaining moments here. As scholars like Steven Pinker, Robert Wright, and Peter Singer have noted, our moral circle has expanded over history. Our attitudes about the rights of women, homosexuals, and racial minorities have all shifted towards inclusiveness. But this is not because our hearts have opened up over the course of history. We are not more empathetic than our grandparents. We really don't think of humanity as our family, and we never will. Okay, question coming out of that. Many people think the book, Uncle Tom's Cabin, was a cause of the American Civil War because it helped white Northerners understand the pain of Southern slaves. Do you accept that? And if you do, does that contradict your thesis? It's a good question. There are a lot of cases, and Uncle Tom's Cabin is one of them, where emotional appeals, including empathic appeals, have pushed the ball forward, have, uh, have made the world a better place. I don't deny it. It's just that for every Uncle Tom's Cabin, there's a birth of a of, of nation, uh, a movie that caused people to devote tremendous support to the KKK, instilled an enormous amount of hatred towards African Americans. Um, for every Schindler's List, there's a Mein Kampf. So empathy is, is, a, is a, a, a gun that points both ways. What I think, where I think we get real progress isn't through emotional appeals. It's ultimately in terms of expanding notions of human rights, of justice, of uh, fairness, of kindness. And, um, and I mean what I say in the quote. I think that although we're kind of living dark days right now, on the whole, the world's been getting better and better. We, our morality has been expanding, um, and uh, uh, the, the, the moral circle has been growing. And I think, um, I think empathy sometimes pushes in favor of it, but sometimes pushes against it. I think what, what has been driving all of these changes is actually greater rationality, sort of thinking, notions of human rights and human justice. Well, I appreciate the need to have a provocative title in order to uh, get the message out and bring this to the public's attention. So the book is called Against Empathy. Do you think if it were titled instead For Rationality, uh, you might be running into uh, fewer problems along the way? I think if I titled it anything else, I'd be running into fewer <laughs> problems right now. But, um, but what I'll say is I, uh, I get the, boast, the best of both worlds because I have a subtitle. So it's Against Empathy, but then it's the case for rational compassion. So, um, so if you don't like the title, just ignore it and pretend that the subtitle is where it's at. <laughs> Classic Canadian compromise, like it. Uh, Paul Bloom, it's very good of you to join us on TVO tonight. Your book, Against Empathy, The Case for Rational Compassion, is now available. And thanks for joining us on the line from New Haven, Connecticut tonight. Thank you so much for having me here. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.